This is the Pontiac Astray, a car once poised to challenge the compact imports reshaping the auto industry in the 1970s. It was small, nimble, affordable, and it carried the promise of practicality in an era marred by oil crises and tightening emissions regulations. Yet, despite its ambitions and its bold styling choices, the Astra has faded into near obscurity, and its name is barely even mentioned in the car world today. So how did a vehicle that was meant to capture the hearts of a new young generation end up slipping through the cracks? What went wrong and what remains of the Astra's brief moment in the spotlight? Join us as we dive into the rise and fall of this forgotten Pontiac, exploring its design, the challenges it faced, and the unique place it holds in automotive history, if only in the memories of the few who still remember. This Malays era compact aimed to bring some added style and flair to the poorly selling Pontiac Astra, which was the Pontiac badged sister car for the Chevy Vega. Everyone just seems to forget that these cars even existed because Chevy sold almost 2 million Vegas and Pontiac sold just 140,000 Astras. And with how few Vegas are left today, it's safe to assume that there were hardly any Pontiac Astras left on the roads today. Seriously though, when was the last time that you saw one of these? The Vega and the Astra were part of GM's foray into the compact economy car market that began in the early 1970s. Now, the Pontiac Astras initially started life just a couple years after the Vega did, and they actually began as a Canadian market car in 1973 because, well, Canada apparently loved Pontiacs. Eventually, though, the Astra made its way stateside for purchase in 1975, and it was positioned as a slightly nicer Vega. With the Astra, you could get a wood grain dash, power steering, air conditioning and other solid quality of life mods that, although don't sound like much, for a budget economy car, the Astra at the time wasn't horribly equipped. And visually, when you stacked up an Astra next to, let's say, a 1975 Trans Am, visually speaking, the cars actually did share some resemblance. I would argue more so than the Vega and a comparable Camaro of the same year did. The taillight panel was quintessentially Pontiac, and as you can see in this side-by-side, -side, you can clearly see a resemblance to a 75 to 77 Trans Am in the rear. We do, however, need to get something out of the way immediately with the Pontiac Astra, though. While it may have looked kinda like a mini Trans Am after a few beers, I can assure you that this car was not fast. In fact, the Astra was slow as a dog. Unlike its Vega sibling, which had the Cosworth version with its specialty built motor, or even the crazy Motion Vegas and Yanko Vegas, there were no fast Astras. These cars, starting in 1973, came equipped with the 2.3 liter Durabilt GM 4 cylinder that you would have found in the base model Vega as well, which made a whopping 75 horsepower with a single barrel carburetor. And the only real saving grace of this engine was the fact that it had a lightweight aluminum block, but that wasn't enough to offset all the other downsides. In 1977, this 2.3 liter inline four was replaced with the new Pontiac 2.5 liter or 151 cubic inch inline four, which became known as the Iron Duke. Interestingly enough though, this engine actually drew heavy inspiration from General Motors 153 cubic inch inline four that they produced and sold in the Brazilian market. Compared to the 2.3 liter Durabilt four cylinder, the Brazilian inline four offered a smoother overall driving experience, which was a complaint by many with the Vega motor. As such, Pontiac mimicked a lot of that design for the new Iron Duke. The overhead cam setup from the Vega's 2.3 was tossed out and replaced with a more traditional, but cheaper to produce pushrod overhead valve design. The new Iron Duke also featured an iron block as opposed to the prior aluminum block, but with just a 20 or so pound weight gain, the added power and reliability of the new engine more than made up for those extra few pounds. In peak trim, the Astra now made a whopping 90 horsepower with the Iron Duke which was a 20% increase over the prior base model engine. 
three, four, and eventually five speed manual transmissions were available in the Astra, as well as a three speed automatic. Performance, though, was pretty abysmal. Zero to 60 for the Astra happened in a not so brisk 14 seconds or so, and the quarter mile was completed in around 20 seconds at 70 miles an hour. Yeah, you weren't winning any races in the Astra, but that new Iron Duke engine that it eventually got did go on to prove itself as an absolute workhorse of a motor reliability wise, which did bode well for the affordable daily driver friendly Astra. And these motors definitely ended up outlasting the chassis that they were put in. And if you receive mail today, you're likely having it delivered by a mail truck powered by the same Iron Duke four cylinder. The Astra was available in hatchback, coupe, and even wagon form, which gave the car lots of variety. However, these were also the same applications that the Chevy Vega already filled, just at a slightly cheaper price point, which meant that stateside the Astra was a bit of a sales nightmare, and at launch, things were not looking good. For its first fully commercialized sales year in America, Pontiac only managed to sell 64,000 Astras. And that was the best sales year ever for the car. The Vega, mind you, that same year sold over 200,000 cars. Starting at $2,800, or just a bit more than the base price of a Vega, the base model Astra's slightly nicer interior was an upgrade over the Vega. But there was also an interior option that Chevy offered for the Vega to make it just like the Pontiac. So the value proposition wasn't really there for the Astra. Moving up in trim levels for the Astra, if you wanted to experience the biggest difference from a regular Vega, then you had to go with the Astra SJ, which featured the plushest interior with nicely trimmed seats and an overall more luxurious interior. But at around $3,600, the SJ trimmed hatchbacks and wagons were knocking on the door of base model Firebird prices, which posed a bit of a problem. The Astra was the cheapest Pontiac on sale at the time, and as such, it was the gateway into the brand. The only problem was that since the gateway to the brand was so closely priced to the base model Vega on the low end, that many people just bought the Vega instead. And on the high end of the pricing spectrum, the Astra SJ was just so closely priced to the Firebird that many people just bit the bullet and bought the base model Firebird instead. And the Firebird actually outsold the Astra by some 20,000 cars in 1975 alone. In terms of performance, unlike the Chevy Cosworth Vega, which got a totally different engine, there was no performance-oriented application for the Astra. Not even the Vega RPO F41 suspension package that was found on the Vega GT. This could have essentially bolted up to the Astra and greatly improved handling, but it never got it. Rather, all of the quote-unquote performance variants of the Astra were largely exterior dress-up packages, and of which there were two of them. The first, which is certainly the best looking, was the 1975 Pontiac Astra Lil Wide Track. This package was the brainchild of a man named Jerry Juska, who collaborated with the Motortown Corporation, which was a company renowned for custom auto work. The Lil Wide Track package featured a front air dam, rear spoiler, new wheels, window louvers, a chrome tip exhaust, and striking decals on the hood, the sides, the rear spoiler, the doors, and the wheel centers. This was a brash overhaul designed to increase the poor sales numbers. Now, I actually love the look of the Lil Wide Track cars. In my opinion, they are the best looking mid-70s H-body product out there. And priced at just over $400 over sticker, Dealers believe that the enhanced aesthetics of this new package was well worth it and would help them sell more cars. Approximately 3,000 Lil Wide Track Astras were ordered by dealerships, and the components were eventually available as a dealer installed kit. And note, even though these cars were named Lil Wide Tracks, they were in fact no wider than a standard car. All of these cars had the 2.3 liter Vega 4 cylinder as they were built before the Iron Duke was released. The next sporty model was the Formula, which came later around 1977. These cars featured the Iron Duke 4 and an available RTS suspension package with front and rear sway bars. Outside of that, they had some new exterior decals, a spoiler, 
and a blacked out rear tail panel, which was also all included on the formula. I can't really find an accurate read on how many formulas were built, but it seems to be in the range between 400 and 1,000 cars before the Astra itself was killed off in 1977, when it was replaced by the Pontiac Sunbird, which still largely shared the same underpinnings. It just offered new, more modern looks. Now, the whole reason for making this video comes from the fact that when I sat down and thought about it, I have literally never ever seen one of these cars in real life, ever. Not at a show, not at a junkyard, barely ever on Craigslist, literally nowhere. And with 140,000 of them made, I have to be honest, I would think there would be more out there, which is now where I call upon you, the viewers. If you ever owned one of these cars or had a story with one, please share it in the comments down below, and we could try our best to at least keep some semblance of history alive for these cars, even if they weren't the best car out there. But as always, thank you all for watching another video. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. It really helps me out. But otherwise, I will see you all next time, enthusiasts.